Chicago Cubs baseball analyst Jim Deshays is killing me. It was a Saturday afternoon, and I was watching my beloved Cubs play the Cincinnati Reds on marquee sports. Deshays, who spent most of his playing career with the Houston Astros, discussed the merits of someone's quality kid time in the stands at venerable Wrigley Field during halftime of the game. Quality baby time is something of a concept these days, and I know I'm not the only one waiting for Deshays to spot a kid in the crowd. All was well, and the Cubs led 7-2 in the fifth inning before the game was paused because the Reds were making a pitching change. Just then, my wife of six years walked into the room, carrying another beer for me and a glass of wine for herself. I stopped watching Quality Baby Time and stared at my wife. Sorry, J.D., but a beautiful baby is not nearly as arousing as the sight of my wife in tight cut-off jean shorts and a tight cami top with no bra. Quality baby time, right? Asked my wife, looking at the big screen. Yeah, but still not as good as quality wife time, I said as she blushed appropriately and sat down across from me on our couch. I showed no delicacy when I stared at her large breasts first. You men are so predictable, she giggled shaking her shoulders slightly, causing her chest to shake. We sat in silence and watched the Cubs go through two more episodes before Vivian decided a commercial break was a good time to talk. Well, Q, why don't we go to Chicago next weekend and do some stuff to start some quality baby-making time, Vivian said cheerfully. You could go to the Cup game and I could go shopping, yes, or something like that. I caught Vivian's intonation on the word, or something like that, and looked at her sideways. Would you like to come to the game with me? Do I have lice or something? I asked innocently. I felt her body tense next to mine. Well, I thought this weekend would be a good time for each of us to do something our own before we have the old throw the birth control pills in the trashes party and get on with starting our family, she said, looking at me with a gorgeous smile and sparkling blue eyes. She knew that I could not refuse her almost anything, especially when she amazed me with her dazzling smile. She's looked at me that way for the last eight years, six of them as a married couple. However, at that moment, something didn't seem quite right to me. I didn't completely discount her plan, but I didn't give it a ringing endorsement either. Yeah, we'll work on something. Let's go to Chicago, I said decisively. Let's both take Friday off and come back Thursday night. I'll make some plans. Leave it to me, Vivian enthused. It was a small blip on the radar, and I never thought much about it until late Friday night in our hotel room when I turned on ESPN on the room TV. We had lunch at a local diner and then visited the Shedd Aquarium. So, dinner and what's next? I asked Vivian, trying to figure out what clothes I was going to wear for the evening. She didn't answer right away, and I looked from the TV to my wife. I was pretty sure I saw her flinch for a moment. Okay. It's the Cubs game against the St. Louis Cardinals today for you. You're sitting right behind the Cubs bench at third base. I thought you could eat and drink there, Vivian said. For me, it's dinner followed by drinks and dancing at one of the most prestigious clubs in the city. I'm not sure when I'll be back, and I don't think I'll be spending too much time here on Saturday either. Then, at Sunday night when we get home, we can have our throw away the pills ceremony and start working on starting a family. Wait, wait, wait. Are you fucking serious? I won't let you walk around Chicago alone for two nights and a day. What about us? What about our vows? I practically screamed. Vivian looked at me like I was a retarded child who needed an explanation. The last part of this assessment was correct. We've been talking about having kids when we're 30 before we got married, right, Q? Well, here we are. But I decided that since I'm the one who's going to do most of the heavy lifting, Work, I should get a bonus from the deal. Bonus? Is it true? I don't remember there being an extra clause in our wedding vows, I growled. You won't be the one who carries this baby for nine months. You won't be the one who sacrifices your toned body. You won't be the one who puts your career on hold for a few years so you can stay home and raise this baby. But I'm going to be the one who works hard to put food on the table and a roof over my family's head the one who has to miss out on all the great things like getting the first word. Isn't that worth something? I asked, also whining. 
She simply ignored my concern, as if it didn't matter. We've been together for eight years, Q. In all that time, have I ever given you any reason to doubt my love for you or my fidelity? The answer is no, never. So I want something just for myself. Bonus. An affair for the weekend. Not love, just lust. For a day and a half. Then you and I will throw away these birth control pills and it will be just you and me forever. Damn it, woman. I hear a lot of me, 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 I growled. Like the old saying, there's no I in the team. Well, there's no I in us either. But I guess if you do this, we will no longer exist. You tell me that it will be just you and me forever if I let you do it. But what about the next time we want to have a baby? Same thing? Anyway, it won't happen in this life. Do you see the lobotomy scar on my forehead? I didn't ask your permission, Q. I don't need your permission, she emphasized. I informed you of what was about to happen. I'm a big girl. I decide who I share my body with. It won't affect who we are once you get over your ego. Not my ego, baby. I'd have to overcome your incredible egoism before I could worry about overcoming my ego, I croaked. Maybe I should go and look for fun like you. She looked like I had slapped her. The bitch arrogance she had given me moments ago was gone, and she suddenly didn't seem so confident. She reached for her phone and texted me my Cubs ticket for the night. You take the car and I'll take an Uber to wherever I'm going, she said, apparently realizing that I'm just not that kind of person. I shook my head in exasperation, collected my keys and phone, and left the room without looking back. I can only assume she thought I was heading to the baseball game like an obedient cuckold to be. Instead of watching the Cubs live, I listened to the game on the radio on the way home. Pat Hughes and the team were ecstatic when the Cubs won another one. I didn't really have a plan other than to get away from Vivian. It's devastating when your perception of someone is at odds with reality. Vivian Langer was working as a teller at my bank when I came to cash my first paycheck at the national trucking firm where I had just been hired. She had only worked at the bank for two weeks, having recently been hired after graduating with a finance degree in college. I was third in line, so I had the opportunity to notice a short blonde with green eyes and what looked like large breasts hiding under her expensive-looking blouse. She seemed to be able to carry on a short conversation with her clients, completing all the tasks they asked her, before it was my turn at her window. You know... Your employer can directly deposit your check electronically so you can avoid those lines every Friday, she told me with a bright smile. I actually knew this because the company's payroll director told me when I was hired, but I'm one of those old school people who like us to hold my check in my hand. I worked summers for my dad as a kid, and he didn't have electronic funds, so I was used to actually cashing my checks. In this case, I was very comfortable in the old school. Besides, Yes, but if I did, then there would be no reason for me to come and see you. Vivian, I said, quickly glancing at the sign with her name next to the window. She blushed adorably and then gave me a thousand megawatt smile. When she bit her lower lip, I realized that she was also showing some interest in me. I chose her in line for the next two weeks, even when there was an open line at another checkout post. The other cashier called me over, but I just smiled and pointed at Vivian. The other cashier immediately understood what I meant and nodded back at me. I like to think that I'm a calm, rational guy, but I'm also not shy with women. The following week, I asked Vivian out on a date. She agreed. Vivian turned out to be sociable and smart. She came from a fairly wealthy family, and her parents still partially financed her lifestyle. When I met her parents, I learned that her father, a fairly well-known lawyer in our city, paid special attention to his youngest child and only daughter. I learned that what Vivian wanted, she usually got if daddy's money and or influence could get it. I was on my way to great things at Bishop Enterprises, which pleased both Vivian and her parents. As our relationship progressed, John Langer made it abundantly clear that he expected me to maintain the style his daughter was accustomed to. Quincy, be kind to my daughter and do right by her, and her mother and I will treat you like one of the family, but treat her poorly, or God forbid you lay hands on her and you will have an enemy. For life with tons of friends, John told me. Yes, 
Quincy is my real name, which is why Vivian and almost everyone else who knows me calls me Q. This is a family name. The firstborn son of every Navarro family for four generations was named Quincy. My uncle is still alive, so my parents actually call me Four. Vivian's parents are an exception to this rule. Everyone else in the Langer family calls me Q, except for John and Barbara. Twenty months after our first date, Vivian and I got married in a grand ceremony that amazed me as well as my parents. The master of ceremonies was actually a state judge, and one of our guests was a United States senator whom Vivian lovingly calls Uncle Sherm. Before we got married, Vivian and I agreed to delay having children until we were 30, so we could succeed both at work and with our bank account. Her 30th birthday was two weeks before our weekend in Chicago. By the time midnight rolled around, I had packed two suitcases and the trunk of my car was loaded with most of my valuables. I called my little brother Bill, and he agreed that I could hide out at his house an hour's drive away for a couple of days until I got my life in order. He and his wife agreed that they would not tell anyone that I was at their house, even if it meant lying to my wife. Although she had not yet realized that I had left Chicago, probably still having sex with her premium boyfriend, I knew that she would understand it by Sunday morning at the latest, when we were supposed to drive home. I barely slept that night, constantly replaying in my head what I had done to suddenly make Vivian believe that she needed intimacy with another man or two, and that I was actually willing to go through with it. The closest I came to the reason was that because I tried my best to give her almost everything she wanted, she considered me either weak or submissive. She soon learned that she was tragically mistaken. On Saturday morning, I did all those financial things that seemed trivial, like canceling all of our joint credit cards and transferring half of our money to an account in my name only. I had no idea whether Vivian returned to the room on Saturday and left again without noticing my absence, or whether she was simply absent from Friday evening until Sunday morning, but I did not receive the first message until Sunday morning, a little after nine. Where are you? We have to check out by 11, she texted. I showed the text to my brother and we laughed while drinking margaritas on his back porch. He stood up to check on the sausages being fried for our brunch. My wonderful sister-in-law was in the kitchen making homemade potato salad. There is nothing better than family comfort when life is going to hell. A second message saying almost the same thing came 30 minutes later, quickly followed by several voicemails in a worse spirit. Her voicemail at 10 o'clock reminded me that she had no way of getting home when I drove us there. Her next voicemail was angry and threatening. What followed was pleading, as she apparently tried to extend her stay at the hotel but couldn't because two of her credit cards had been canceled. Damn, those margaritas were great. Aren't you praying that you'll make peace with that stupid bitch? Asked my sister-in-law, Sharon. You two seem to have a pretty good marriage, and I know you still love her. I would kill for her, and I know it won't just go away quickly, but the way she did it tells me that at best, I'm number two on her list of people to love, after herself. My brother's cell phone rang around five, while the three of us were still sitting on the back porch after drinking a lot of margaritas. He showed me the caller ID and raised his eyebrows, giving me the opportunity to answer if I wanted. I mouthed, Hell no. He handed the phone to Sharon, who was still a little sober, at least compared to me and Bill. Hey, Viv, I'm answering Bill's call because the drunk bastard doesn't have the guts to answer himself. Yes, we know what happened. No, we don't know where he is now. How the hell could you do that to the nicest guy in the world, Viv? Sharon said. I could only imagine what Vivian was saying to her on the other end of the line. Sharon rolled her eyes a couple of times and scrunched her face once. She said, uh-huh, twice and mmm twice more. Finally, she wished Vivian good luck and hung up. Bought you some time. No way, Sharon snapped at me. You knew you two had a disagreement and you left her without giving her an explanation. You really are a bastard, you know? You don't buy this, I started. No, I'm not going to cue. Just telling you what she told me and what she's probably telling others while she's looking for you, Sharon said. Crap, I hissed. Someone pour me another Rita. Bill did me the honor of proving once again why I think he's a great brother. Hey, eight years ago I had no intention of applying for a Mensa membership. 
On Monday morning, I ignored the hangover and showed up to work at my usual time, although I was not dressed for work. I walked into my boss's office and told him I was either quitting or moving to one of our other offices. Effective immediately. Wow, you don't give the guy much time to think, do you? My boss said sarcastically. What's going on, Q? I told my boss everything, including my half-baked plan to disappear. For a while, if I'm lucky, it will take my wife, actually, my father-in-law, several months to find me once he actually starts looking. The only thing I asked my boss, other than the transfer, was that my employee name be changed to Oliver, which is my middle name, and that absolutely no information about me be disclosed, at least legally. Less than five minutes later, my boss agreed on my next job. There was room for me in the Santa Fe, New Mexico office, and 30 minutes later, Oliver Navarro was on his way to a new life. Officially, Quincy Navarro was no longer employed in Indiana, and technically speaking, I was no longer employed by Bishop Enterprises either. I started my new job a week later. The company found me a one-bedroom apartment that was nice enough for my new bachelor life. I also purchased a new phone and provider so that the phone bill and associated calls did not go to my wife. At home, I only gave out my new number to a few select people. Two of those who did not receive this number were my mother and father. My brother told me that my mom told him off for what I did and seemed to be completely on Vivian's side. I didn't need to take crap from her and I didn't trust her not to give Viv's number. My father was collateral damage in this battle. I knew that if I gave him my number, my mother would eventually wear him down and take him away, and then he and I would have problems. So I didn't drag him into it. Bill and Sharon, however, had broad shoulders, and I knew Mom would never inherit that from them. God knows she tried, Vivian tried too. According to Bill, it took her about a week to realize that I was no longer in her city. How can we work things out if we don't talk, if we can't sit down and look each other in the face? She asked Bill. Maybe he doesn't want to fix it, Viv. You kind of broke his heart in Chicago. Bill told me he responded to her. It was only two nights, Bill. It didn't mean anything, she said. To you, maybe. It meant everything to him, Bill replied. My career in Santa Fe continued just fine for the next year. My social life not that I was looking for it, was completely non-existent. I was fine with that. I sometimes asked Bill to check with me to see if I was still married. Surprisingly, Viv did not tender her resignation. I could only wonder why. I would sometimes go out with my co-workers in the evening at the end of the workday, but I didn't go on my first date until after I had lived in Santa Fe for about 18 months. To quote Bob Sager, she was, a black-haired beauty with large, dark eyes and glasses that sat very high. She was half Pueblo, half Hispanic, with muscular legs that felt wonderful when she wrapped them around me during sex. We dated a few times, but I knew she was looking for something more permanent, which I couldn't give her. Two months later, I met Evangeline, Angel Born, while sitting behind the counter of my favorite quiet pub. She was a typical Irish girl with auburn hair, freckles, and bright blue eyes. I later learned that she also had the famous Irish temperament. I was still wearing my jacket and tie, having come straight from one of those days at the office where I spent time putting out fires and sipping Jack Daniel's Tennessee honey, when I heard a woman's voice call out to me, the one my girl's at the bar. You'll all find yours, as several women entered. I assumed that all four women had come from their shifts at one of the local factories, since they were all dressed in jeans and work shirts. The one who was leisurely walking towards me had her work shirt unbuttoned to the middle, and her breasts were visible. I wasn't too subtle as I watched her breasts sway when she approaches. What are we drinking tonight, Mr. Guy in the fancy suit? She asked with a wide smile and laughing eyes. Tennessee, honey, are you okay with this? I asked. Angel and I spent the night talking, dancing, and drinking. I learned that she had gone to a rare sleepover because her two-year-old was with a babysitter. The child's father was unknown, she told me with great embarrassment in her voice. I had a little too much to drink, I was alone, and I'm pretty sure I got drugged by two guys I was hanging out with. I learned a few lessons that night, the most important of which 
is that neither I nor my friends should ever leaving the bar alone with a man if we didn't come with him. We all leave together, or at least leave in pairs, she explained. But my daughter is a gift from God. She is the most precious thing in my life. She took out her phone, pressed it a few times, and opened a photo of an adorable baby. Do you have children? she asked. I don't think it will ever happen to me, I said, beginning my story of how I ended up in Santa Fe. Wow, this is terrible, but you're still married to her? You should take care of that, she said. I should have, but at the time I just wanted to get away quickly. And then there's the matter of actually talking to the stupid bitch. Angel and I actually went on a few dates as a couple, and then I started taking her and my daughter on kid-friendly dates. Eleanor was shy at first until I was actually on the same level as her. I read this somewhere and Hoover wrote it was fucking brilliant. I instantly became her favorite adult, Angel told me. There were times when Angel and I would snuggle up on her sofa and Eleanor would take my hand and pull me towards her until I climbed off the sofa and sat on the floor, at which point she would crawl into my lap like a puppy and fall asleep. This really seemed to impress Angel, but I have to admit that I liked it too. Angel and I got along well, but we never discussed exclusivity. When we first started dating, she told me that she already had someone she dated occasionally. I didn't believe Angel, and I wear in this for the long howl, and because she was honest with me, I had no problem continuing with her other relationship. You know the old saying about assumptions. Well, I just assumed that Angel's other relationship was with a man named Bobby. We never really discussed Bobby, just as I assumed she didn't discuss me with him. However, about three months into our relationship, she mentioned that she and Bobby had gone bikini shopping a couple of days earlier. Wait, what? I said. Is Bobby a woman? B-O-O-B-B-I-I. -I. Not Bobby, like Robert. Well, yeah, didn't I mention this before? Bobby is a woman. She likes girls. And I'm bisexual. Are you sure we didn't talk about this? Earlier? I shook my head silently, and Angel suddenly started looking at her arms, her legs, anywhere but right at me. Is this a problem, Oliver? She said it barely above a whisper. I've really never thought about something like this before. I knew bisexuals, but I'd never dated one before, which I knew anyway. It took me a minute to process this before I realized that in our relationship, it didn't matter what gender the person was in her other relationships. I don't think so, unless she's really pretty. I think, for the most part, women are nicer to look at than guys. And if she's really pretty, then I'll suffer a lot in comparison. Should I worry? I asked. She's cute, but I don't think you should worry too much. You both literally bring different things to the table. She giggled lightly, which made me laugh. Are you sure I've never told you I'm bi before? I usually try to make all my dates known as early as possible so I don't mislead anyone. It usually hurts feelings, she said. So now you're wondering, what do we do when we hang out together? Are you such a pig? No, I never wanted to know what you two did together when I thought Bobby was another man. It doesn't matter now that I know she's a woman. We're not mutually exclusive, and your privacy belongs to, to you, just as my life belongs to me. So she's pretty, huh? I tried to look at her seriously, but she knew me well enough to know that I was playing her hard. Am I Eleanor's favorite? I asked in a childish voice. You know it is, she replied back. I essentially became Angel's backup for Eleanor's nanny, getting written permission to pick up the baby on the few occasions when Angel stayed late at work. I bought a child car seat for my Mustang and installed it permanently because no one else ever rode in the back seat of that car. I didn't put two and two together when my cell phone rang a couple of months later and the caller ID said it was Bobby Clarkson. Angel never told me Bobby's last name, and there was never really any reason why she would call me. Except for one thing. My stomach clenched nervously as I answered. For the next few minutes, Bobby, almost hysterical, told me that Angel had died in a car accident on the way home from work. Police arrived on the scene and found Angel's cell phone and called Bobby who was mentioned several times in Angel's call history. Bobby went to the hospital, but Angel had already left. 
When Bobby could think straight for a minute, she realized that Eleanor needed to be taken from the nanny, and Angel one day told her that I had permission to do this. We agreed to meet at Angel's apartment after I picked up Eleanor. Bobby was sitting sobbing at the kitchen table in the apartment when I ran in creeing with a very confused child. The woman ran up to use and hugged us both, continuing to cry. We probably stood there for about five minutes, two crying adults and a baby between us in a tight embrace. We finally broke away from each other when I noticed that we needed to feed the baby and take care of some things. We've pieced together some of Angel's life based on what she told us both. She was an only child whose parents had died, and there did not appear to be any aunts or uncles in the photograph. This meant that we had to take care of Eleanor until we could figure out which government agency should take over. Bobby found a couple cans of tuna and made sandwiches for us and put some in a bowl so we could feed Eleanor. After some more searching, I found a box of juice and Cheerios. In between bouts of crying for our departed friend, Bobby and I struggled to come up with a plan for Eleanor. We came to the realization that she was legally a ward of the state and would likely be placed in the foster care system, but neither of us could come to terms with that decision. We may have been thinking incorrectly, but we felt it was best for the child to remain with one of us for the foreseeable future rather than be placed in the foster care system. If the state doesn't know about her, they won't try to take her away and put her in foster care. She can just stay with us. They always talk about how a lot of kids fail. Eleanor can pull through and stay with us, with me. I volunteered. What do you know about raising a child? Bobby asked quickly. Honestly, nothing, but I was once a child, I remarked. Great. Not exactly the answer I was looking for, she said. We walked in circles for the next hour, trying to come up with a good plan for Eleanor. Ultimately, we came to the conclusion that I would give up my apartment, move in with Angel, and become the child's primary caregiver, along with daycare. Bobby said she would stop by often to help. We were both very aware of the fact that neither of us had ever been a parent before. What's that old saying? The blonde leading the blind? She asked, making me laugh for the first time all evening. Actually, it's the blind leading the blind, but your way is funnier, I objected. By the way, I'm Oliver Navarro. It's a pleasure to formally meet you, Bobby, I said formally, extending my hand for a handshake. She looked at my hand before looking me in the eyes. She walked past my outstretched hand and into my personal space, enveloping me in a tearful hug. God, I'm going to miss her so much, she said. Me too, was all I could say in response. The next morning, I called my office and explained to my boss that I needed a couple of personal days to sort things out with Eleanor. Bobby and I decided that we would cremate Angel's body. It took Eleanor, Bobby and me a couple of weeks to sort of settle into a routine. Bobby showed up at the apartment almost every evening after work, and we shared cooking duties. I could understand why Angel liked her. She was smart and funny, with a bit of Angel's sass. She was also tall, blonde, blue-eyed, and very curvy. I enjoyed her company and missed her on the few evenings when she didn't come. She and I talked many evenings about our feelings for Angel. Three months had passed when one evening, after I had put Eleanor to bed, a somewhat agitated Bobby came up to me. I was sitting at one end of the three-cushion couch in the living room, and Bobby sat on the cushion right next to me, facing me, with her legs tucked under her. Most women do this quite easily. Most guys have a hard time getting into this position without a solid surface like the floor or ground underneath them. Yes? I asked, drawing out the word in anticipation of something. Oliver, what would you say about getting a bigger apartment and me moving in with you full time? She asked. It would be better for our wallets, and we could share better with Eleanor. I love the child, and I guess I want to be her, her mother, sort of. And you could be her father, sort of. I know, you love her too. We don't have to be married to raise a child. In fact, when we're both at home, we can even have our own social lives. And since we're friends, not lovers, that should reduce the chances of that, that we will part, for example. Okay, you don't have to say that, just like my wife and I. Bobby really was a beautiful woman, but since I knew that she played for another team... I would never pester her. That would be the height of rudeness. 
However, I became attached to her, to say the least. We both loved Eleanor madly. The plan sounded... Actually, it made really good sense in my opinion. Bound by obligations to Eleanor, and perhaps because there were no emotional or sexual games at play, the friendship between Bobby and I became strong. The three of us grew into a real family, which became even stronger when Eleanor began calling us mom and dad, something she obviously learned from the other children in kindergarten. Who would have thought that two little words could have such an effect on two adults? The first time she called me daddy when I held her in my arms, my heart almost jumped out of my chest. When she first called Bobby mom, I thought Bobby was going to fall apart completely. She had just finished tying Eleanor's shoes, and Eleanor said, Thank you, Mommy. Bobby gasped for a second and then ran to the bathroom so Eleanor wouldn't see her tears. She came out of the bathroom two minutes later, tears still in her eyes, but a big smile on her face. Yes, Mommy, it hurt me too, I told her. She hit me hard on my right hand. I smiled and nodded. Other than the fact that Bobby and I never engaged in sweet husband-wife touching, I thought we fit in well with the parents of Eleanor's friends at school and at social events for the next few years. We told the truth about being unmarried to those who asked, and we never really engaged with the birth stories, kind of going off topic and ignoring those discussions. You could have swept me off my feet when Vivian, yes, that Vivian, showed up at our front door one Saturday morning, about four years after I left her. Um, Oliver, someone came to see you, Bobby said from the living room as I sat at the kitchen table playing blocks with Eleanor. Eleanor followed me into the living room, and I'm not sure which of us looked more shocked, me or Vivian. Is... is this yours, Q? asked my wife, looking at Eleanor as if she had seen a ghost. I had to close my gaping mouth to answer. Well, actually, she's ours, I said, looking from Bobby to myself. Yours? She can't be yours. We're still married. I could see it wouldn't be easy for Vivian, who looked like she was about to collapse on the floor. I invited her to sit on our sofa, and she quickly sat down. Calm down, Viv. Bobby and I aren't married, but Eleanor is still our daughter, I said. Oh, oh, kind of good. We could live with that, Vivian muttered. What are you talking about, Vivian? Why are you here after all this time? Aren't we divorced by now? I opened fire quickly. Much to my surprise, I learned that I was still married to Vivian. She did not file for divorce, believing that I would return to her within the first year. She and her father then searched for me for almost two years before she spent another year working up the courage to finally approach me for reconciliation. Reconcile? Seriously? Why? I asked in a faster tone. Four years aren't enough for me to get over you ripping my heart out and acting like the wicked bitch of the West. Damn it. A lifetime wouldn't be enough. You know I love you. I always have. I always will, Vivian said. I made a mistake. A damn big mistake, but still a mistake. I'm sorry for what I did, and I'm sorry for trying to take advantage of your good nature. I thought that if I put you in a little shock and awe... I would overwhelm you, and you'd have no choice but to go along with it. I also didn't think you'd give up on me for a weekend of sex. Sex, not love. Wasn't having kids and spending the rest of our lives together enough of a compromise for the sake of weekend sex? You knew me better than anyone, I said. You knew how I felt about fidelity. You blatantly rubbed my face in it. I will not tolerate such disrespect from anyone, not even my loving wife. She looked around the room, her gaze falling on Bobby and Eleanor for a few seconds. It looks like you came to your senses very quickly, she said. It's like you didn't waste any time at all. By the way, your asshole boss at home really had your back. He kept telling Dad's investigators that Quincy Navarro no longer worked there when you first moved to another office and started calling yourself by your middle name. Dad finally got a court order to review Bishop's work records, and then he remembered that your middle name was Oliver. After that, I just had to work up the courage to approach you. Okay, you came to me, I said. Even if I were the biggest dumbass in history, I now have a family that I would never leave. I have a beautiful woman who I love and who I completely trust with all my heart. She respects me, and I respect her. 
we have a beautiful daughter who we will cherish long after she grows up to be a beautiful woman. We are us. I like being a part of us. Remember, a long time ago, I told you that there is no I in the team. There is no I in us. I raise my voice significantly, almost to the point of shouting. For the first time, Vivian looked truly remorseful. I glanced quickly at Bobby and Eleanor. Bobby looked shocked. Eleanor looked scared. I walked over to my girls, and we hugged tightly. I looked at my little girl and whispered, Everything will be okay, honey. I understand now, Q, Vivian said quietly, looking at us. I'll file for divorce on grounds of abandonment as soon as I get home. I don't need anything from you financially, but would I be crossing the line if I asked you to forgive me for being a selfish bitch? I can try, Viv, but this is the best I can do. Maybe with time. I croaked. Vivian stood up from the couch, gave me a half smile, and left the apartment and, I hoped, my life forever. Bobby sent Eleanor to her room to play. She took my hand and directed me to the sofa, sitting next to me so that our knees touched. She had the same look as Eleanor had a few minutes ago. Did you mean what you said to your wife a few minutes ago? About us being... Us? She asked. Completely, I replied. I know you and I don't love each other, just like that. But I really love you. I trust you completely. I respect you and I believe that you respect me too. And I know that you love us. Us. You understand. I understand, she said simply, smiling brightly. I guess finally getting a legal divorce was supposed to improve my dating life. But I knew I wasn't going to run off and start having sex with every decent-looking woman I came across. I was never like this before I got married. And now that I have a family, it's definitely become less of a priority. I still had fun sometimes, but I wasn't looking for the next Mrs. Navarro. Bobby dated more people than me and had a better social life than me. We communicated constantly about these issues and made sure that our daughter was always first in our plans. We also had a rule that none of us were to bring dates home for anything other than food. Eleanor was probably about 11 years old when Bobby and I made the difficult decision that she was ready to learn the truth about who she was and who we were. I know that the night we were going to tell her, there were two adults there, sweating profusely. We've been talking about this for almost a year. The three of us shed many tears that evening. We showed Eleanor photographs of her birth mother and explained her mother's relationship to both Bobby and me. We also had to explain that Angel is bisexual and Bobby likes girls. Of course, we also had to explain our decision not to hand Eleanor over to the state and to raise her ourselves. So, we're not family by blood, we're family by love, Bobby concluded. I know that Eleanor was puzzled and worried for several days as she sorted out for herself what Bobby and I had laid upon her. She was a smart kid and mature for her age, and a few days later it seemed to be stuck in her brain. You guys could have just let child services take me. Wouldn't that be easier for both of you? She asked when we were having dinner. Doing the right thing is not always easy, I replied. I haven't regretted my decision for a minute, except maybe for the time you threw up birthday cack on my new suite when you were six. And I'm sure mom didn't regret it either. A tearful Bobby nodded her heed whipping her nose with a napkin. Besides our own friends, Bobby and I had a few friends that we became friends with as a couple. And sometimes she and I would go out for the evening with a few of those friends. Bobby liked to dance, so we did it from time to time. She was a better dancer than me, but I worked hard to keep up. Our friends, most of whom knew we weren't a couple, often commented on how good we looked together. Bobby sometimes danced with other friends when we were not at home. But she never accepted invitations from strangers for obvious reasons. No matter how pretty she was, she never lacked attention from either men or women. Most of the men who approached her took her gentle refusals well, but not all. She had just returned to our table after dancing with one of our friends, John, when the guy, who I'm guessing was about ten years younger than her, had a problem with her turning him down. Oh, come on, baby. I'm better than that guy you just danced with or that guy you're sitting with. Come on, give me a chance, he demanded, grabbing her wrist and trying to drag her back to the dance floor. I'm skinny at 6'2", 180, but at 41, 
I was still in pretty good shape. And no matter what, I wouldn't let anyone treat a friend like that. I grabbed the hand that was holding Bobby's wrist and twisted it. The teenager howled in pain and released Bobby's wrist, which turned out to be a big mistake. Freeing herself from the man's grip, Bobby turned to him and quickly raised her right knee. Did I mention she played soccer in college? The young man collapsed to the floor, but not before his face hit the table on the way down. By the time the bar manager and bouncer arrived at our table, the young man was curled up in a fetal position, his face covered in blood. The police were called, and after we all gave statements, we were assured that no charges would be brought against Bobby or me. I appreciate the help, but Al Clarkson's daughters were taught self-defense by the time we started dating. No matter who we were dating, this young man made a really bad mistake tonight, Bobby said. I like your father's way of thinking. Let's ask him to teach Eleanor the next time he and your mother come to visit, I said. We moved into a five-bedroom house a couple of years ago and did a bit of remodeling so that we effectively had the equivalent of two master bedrooms with ensuite bathrooms. We also had a large family room with a built-in snack area, so Eleanor and a few friends would often gather at our house. Bobby and I became de facto parents to several teenagers, and to be honest, we both loved it. I knew Bobby had been dating the same woman for about two months when she invited her to Saturday dinner with Eleanor and me. I decided that this woman must be truly special when Bobby finally kicked me out of the kitchen and cooked what I considered her best dish, veal parmigiana with spaghetti. At least visually, Stephanie Ellis was truly special. If Bobby was an 8 to a 9, Stephanie was a 9 to a 9.5 with big brown eyes, porcelain skin, curly shoulder-length dark brown hair, and the body of a Sports Illustrated swimsuit model. Damn it, Dad. You need to let Mom find you a woman. She's really good at choosing, Eleanor told me quietly, shortly after Stephanie showed up. Yeah, you're definitely right about that, kid, I replied. Stephanie turned out to be as special on the inside as she was on the outside. I liked her. Eleanor quickly fell in love with her, and Bobby was in seventh heaven. It was really cool to see Bobby's eyes light up every time Stephanie walked into the room. I barely remembered what those days were like, but when I searched my memory, I felt a pang of jealousy. It took Stephanie a while to get comfortable with our family dynamics and the incredibly close relationship Bobby and I had developed. We were co-parents with a child we had raised since she was two years old, and we were much closer than best friends. We talked about everything from the meaningless to, yes, even the crazy. I was surprised when I received a call from Stephanie a few weeks after she started coming to our home regularly. She asked if we could meet for lunch, and she asked me not to tell Bobby. I hesitantly agreed. Two days later, I was sitting in a restaurant when Stephanie walked in, noticed me, and headed over to my table. I could see the envy on several men's faces as she sat down and I chuckled to myself. In most cases, fantasy is better than real life. After we exchanged pleasantries and placed our order, Stephanie wasted no time in getting to the point. She explained that she had not been able to properly understand Bobby's relationship with me and did not want to become too involved with a woman who might already be in a loving relationship. She looked worried as I smiled brightly. Wow, if only. Beautiful women like Bobby don't date guys like me even if she wasn't into girls. I'll take that as a compliment of sorts, I said. But you're right, we do have a loving relationship, which definitely requires some explanation. So I spent the next hour explaining. We both returned to work late, but before leaving, Stephanie gained a much better understanding of our family and rye whiskey. Okay, I agree, she said. I would love to be part of this family. Bobby and Stephanie married six months later. I gave Bobby away at the altar because her father had passed away a few years earlier. Fifteen-year-old Eleanor was one of the bridesmaids. Eleanor was the spitting image of her late biological mother with red hair and blue eyes, and I was afraid of being the father of a cute teenager in high school because I remembered being a teenager in high school. According to Bobby and Stephanie, I didn't handle it well. You can't threaten high school kids with bodily harm because they kissed your daughter. Bobby snapped one day after Eleanor and the young man had gone on a date. 
Did you see her face? You completely confused her. You won't date her boyfriends anymore? Stephanie agreed. I'm sure one of us will be able to effectively convey your good wishes to them in the future. Yes, the women made me apologize. Dad, would you be as crazy if I decided to date women? Eleanor asked. Probably not, but then you'd have to deal with Mom and Stephanie. It certainly wouldn't be any easier for your date, I pointed out. Eleanor thought for a few seconds. I watched as several emotions crossed her face. Damn. As much as I hate to admit it, it could have been worse, she replied. I chuckled and felt better when she left. Are there any words a man fears more than the phrase, we need to talk? The answer is a clear no, but given my family's situation, I was more puzzled than scared when Bobby said this phrase to me one Friday evening while Eleanor was with friends. She directed me to our formal living room, a room that we almost always only used when we had guests. An excited Stephanie was already in the room, and she handed me a shot glass of what appeared to be Angel's Envy Rye as I walked in and sat down in the reclining chair she pointed me to. Bobby sat down on the couch across from Stephanie. They both had glasses of white wine. I felt completely clueless. You got me, ladies. I fully and sincerely apologize for everything I did wrong and I won't do it again. Ever, I said with all sincerity. The two women looked at each other in confusion before it dawned on Bobby. Relax, Oliver. It's not what you think it is. But we can save that apology for the next time you screw up, okay? Bobby giggled. We need a favor, she continued, suddenly hesitant. She looked at me, swallowed, swallowed convulsively and moved her mouth, but nothing came out. Stephanie finally intervened. Uh... Oliver, Stephanie and I would like to have a baby, and we would like you to lend us your help. We need your fluid for in vitro fertilization. Would you do that for us? I admit it took a few seconds to realize this. Then I felt myself smiling. Then I felt myself smiling as widely as I had ever smiled in my life. Oh, hell yes! I screamed, causing wild celebration in the room as two women jumped up and down on either side of me like fifth graders on a sugar binge. How did you two choose me? Why did you choose me? I asked when we got settled and returned to our seats. They looked at each other, both with huge smiles on their cute faces. Choosing you was a lot easier than asking, Stephanie said. I know you won't believe this, but we chose you because you're smart, personable, respectful, handsome, and fit, Bobby continued. You are a great father and a good person. It would be amazing if our child inherited some of these good traits. Ah, damn. I've only cried a few times since I became an adult. That day was one of those days. I cried like a child. You know, if you guys want, I could sell you my half of the house so you guys can... No, 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 Bobby interrupted. We don't want you to move. We want you to be here. We were kind of hoping that you would help us raise our child like you and I raised Eleanor. I think we did a pretty good job of that, don't you? I have to admit, I thought we raised a wonderful daughter, and honestly... I had a great time doing it. I was a little concerned about what Stephanie thought, but she must have seen it coming. Research shows that all children cope better at home with both a mother and a father. Imagine how well this child could cope with two mothers and a father, and a sister before Eleanor went off to college, Stephanie said. I mumbled, thank you, as I continued to cry and sniffle. I love you guys. Do you know that? I literally burst into tears. We told Eleanor about our plans that evening over dinner. She jumped out of her chair and hugged Bobby and Stephanie. Wow, I'm going to be a big sister. How cool is that? She squealed with joy. Two months later, Bobby, Eleanor, and I waited for Stephanie to come out of their bedroom bathroom to confirm that she was pregnant. She walked out with tears of happiness rolling down her cheeks. We hugged tightly. On a purely personal level, I had so many emotions running through my head. A little over 13 years ago, it seemed to me that I was doomed to live my entire life without having children. Now I was just a few months away from having my second child. Yes, family comes in all shapes and configurations. I've always been impressed by Eleanor's intelligence and her relative maturity as she gets older. She always seemed to be able to come to terms with the fact that our family was only slightly different from most of her friends. 
She mentioned that she was sometimes teased, but I never heard her really complain about how she worried too much about Bobby being the wrong orientation, that Bobby and I weren't married, and that the three of us were different. Surnames. Of course, then we added a fourth person and a fourth last name, and then a fifth person, although the baby's last name was Stephanie. We decided to keep Eleanor's last name as it already was because it was already listed on her birth certificate. She always seemed to be popular with her classmates, and over the years she and her friends would often hang out at our house, including her friends from the university soccer team and band. Adults, however, are not as forgiving as children, and from time to time over the years we have heard some secondhand chirps from other adults. However, it was mostly kept quiet when we were around, as I don't think very many people wanted to get involved with me, much less Bobby, who was known to have a sharp tongue on those rare occasions when she felt the need to protect your family. Eleanor became the leader of her class and had to give a speech at graduation. I'm good with words and offered to help, but she told me that I had already done enough for her speech and she didn't need any more help. In fact, she never worked on it with me or with Bobby and Stephanie. I guess that I, like everyone else, would have to wait to hear it. Roman Alexander Ellis was less than a year old when I followed Bobby and Stephanie into the gym on graduation day. We were constantly delayed as every woman we met along the way stopped us and admired the child. Eleanor gave her second speech at the ceremony, and I couldn't help but smile when I read the program and saw that her speech was entitled, There's No I in Team. The essence of the talk was about how team effort can overcome individual weaknesses and the importance of everyone rowing in the same direction. She used the differences in our family as an example of how four, now five, people could be one successful unit. I'm pretty sure I grew another inch that day. While Eleanor spoke, there were few dry eyes in the house. It was a family trip when we took Eleanor to Arizona State University for her freshman year of college. We left Santa Fe five days early and did all sorts of touristy things before parting ways with her. As we prepared to leave, we lined up in front of her for a goodbye hug. I was last in line, and thinking about it later, I realized that the order was not random. Promise me, Dad, that you'll try harder to find a good woman, she told me quietly as the others walked back to the car. I know this wasn't a priority for you while I was home, but now that I'm gone, Mom has a good woman. You need her too. I'll try, baby, but I can't promise, I answered just as quietly. Good women like Stephanie don't grow on trees, you know. I suppose it was only natural that Roman called me daddy when he first started talking, and my heart always seemed to expand when he did. What surprised me was that he called Bobby and Stephanie mommies, and somehow they always knew which one he was talking to. I didn't hear any noticeable difference in his pronunciation of the word, but both women somehow understood it. Two years after graduating from Arizona State University, Eleanor gave me the incredible thrill of being able to walk her down the aisle to marry her. This was pretty much the only thing I had to do at the wedding as my daughter, Bobby and Stephanie, did all the hard work, smiling and laughing all the while. All I did was pay my share and get seven-year-old Roman out of the way. Jack Lassiter seemed like a very nice young man, but that still didn't stop me from threatening him with physical harm if he ever laid a hand on my little girl. I told him I would never interfere in his marriage except if he ever insulted Eleanor. When he said he understood and agreed, it was in a choked voice, because I had him in a one-arm chokehold during our discussion. Sue me. She is my little girl, and I just wanted my future son-in-law to understand that actions have consequences. I may have been over 50, but I was still in good physical shape and went to the gym three days a week. The wedding went off without a hitch, and I was confident that I would enjoy my daughter's big day. I visited every table of the guests, ate delicious food, drank good liquor, and danced with many women. I was standing and talking with a few friends when a ghostly woman with shoulder-length silver hair and purple streaks on the sides walked up to me, grabbed my right arm, and pulled me towards the dance floor. Do you have a minimum height limit for your dance partner's stud? She asked, lowering me to the floor to the loud laughter of those standing nearby. In case you were wondering, I'm Aunt Deb, the purple-haired elf said as we stopped on the dance floor. I'm Jack's mom's best friend. I used to change your new son-in-law's diapers sometimes.
My nephew had nothing but good things to say about you, and he also warned me about your killer touch. She smiled radiantly, showing me her perfect teeth and cheerful blue eyes. I gave her what I thought was a subtle visual inspection of her body, noticing that she was built like a gymnast with small breasts and a powerful lower body and legs. The first two songs were fast, and I found that she knew how to move her cute body well. The next one was slow, and although I tried to put a decent distance between us, she practically clung to me from the very beginning. I can tell someone goes to the gym regularly, Deb said. After that, we went hand in hand to the bar for a drink. I was almost sure she was marking her territory. I certainly didn't mind. But if that was the case, she would first have to go through the American version of the Spanish Inquisition. Bobby and Stephanie. I brought her to our table and sat her down after introducing her. I was glad that two of my closest friends in the entire world gave her 30 seconds to get comfortable before the interrogation began in earnest. I'm going to the bar to get you another drink. I know you'll need it, I said with a big smile as I stood up. Jack's mother approached me at the bar, a big smile on her face as she looked at Deb sitting at my table with Bobby and Stephanie. She's a real pistol, but I heard you three care about each other a lot. Let's see how she takes it, Marsha Lassiter said. Wait a few minutes before you go back. That's exactly what I did. Marsha told me something about Deb. At 55, she was a year younger than me and had been married for 15 years before she caught her husband cheating on her about 10 years ago. She hit him below the belt and then threw him out, Marcia said. I returned to my table five minutes later to find three women laughing hysterically. For some reason, I didn't feel nearly as comfortable as I did when I left. Two-year-old Kayla Lassiter ran around our huge house with our two Labrador retrievers, giggling hysterically while her parents sat sipping iced tea at our kitchen table with four of her six grandparents. Jack and Eleanor lived about 45 minutes west of us and spent a lot of time at our house with our first grandchild. Jack's parents, Marcia and Tom, admitted that they were a little jealous of how much we got to see Kayla, so we invited them to spend a week with us over Christmas, so all six grandparents and Uncle Roman could enjoy the holiday together. Marcia was an easy sell because it also gave her a chance to see her best friend Deb, whom she hadn't seen in a year since Deb and I got married and Deb moved to Santa Fe. Tom was a little harder to sell. He admitted to me in private when they arrived that he was uncomfortable around Bobby and Stephanie because he had never had close personal contact with girls of the wrong orientation before. They're just regular married people like you and Marcia. That's really all you need to know, man. I would trust any of them with my wallet, my wife, my daughter, my granddaughter, and my life, he explained. I told him, well, I must admit that they are both very attractive women, he said. I always thought that girls like that weren't pretty and masculine looking. That's definitely not the case with them. I could see he was embarrassed when I laughed heartily at his statement. Good God, no, I chuckled in response. Don't overdo it, Tom. They're still women. They each have more shoes than you and I combined. Deb was everything I could have dreamed of in a wife, and I had no idea what I needed. I was a laid-back person, but she was not like that at all. I didn't think I lacked energy, but this woman just couldn't sit still. The first spring she lived with us, I had to cultivate a garden for her. We, count me, then spent hours planting all sorts of vegetables for the salad while she looked after. I gave her a dressing down for being part cat, because everyone knows that cats are nature's best guardians. Bobby and Stephanie fell in love with her, figuratively almost as quickly as I literally fell in love with her. However, that didn't stop them from warning her before our wedding that they would both crush her into dust if she broke my heart. She seemed pretty shocked when she told me about it the day after they made their announcement to her. I'm pretty sure they weren't kidding you, baby, I said seriously, like I was having a heart attack. We have each other's backs all the time. I know they weren't kidding me. I don't plan on ever hurting you. But if I do, I won't hang around here. I'll run so fast your head will spin. It's called self-preservation, she said. Deb convinced Marcia and Tom that Santa Fe was a great place to retire, and that's exactly what they did eight years later. 
They actually retired a little earlier than planned when the house next door to ours came up for sale. Tom gave his full support when he learned that Bobby was also a Premier League football fan. Bobby's team was Arsenal, while Tom's favorite team was Crystal Palace. I can imagine what it would be like if we were sitting in an English pub during the game, although there was a bit of an argument when their two teams went head-to-head. -head. Fuck off, bitch, and eat shit, old man, were not uncommon phrases when we all gathered to watch Arsenal and Crystal Place play out a draw. Soccer fans, soccer is much more intense for Americans than baseball fans, Deb, Stephanie, Marcia, and I came to learn. Jack and Eleanor didn't bring their three grandchildren to the Arsenal Crystal Palace game. It was a beautiful summer evening in Santa Fe, and I was sitting on the porch swing behind my house, sipping Jameson Black Barrel Irish whiskey, thinking about how lucky I was. My eldest granddaughter came out the back door and sat next to me, leaning her thin body against mine. Once again, I noticed that she was the young doppelganger of her late grandmother, with her auburn hair and bright blue eyes. What are you thinking about, Grandpa? She asked, calling me by her special name for me. I was thinking about my life. How lucky I am, I replied. How lucky are you? She asked. I took a sip of whiskey, trying to figure out how to phrase my response to a nine-year-old. Well, baby... You know when something bad happens and everything ends well? That's kind of what happened to me. She fidgeted a little next to me, and when I looked at her face, I could see in her eyes that she was thinking hard. Then she broke into a wide smile as understanding dawned on her. Yeah, like when I scraped my knee the other day and Grandma Deb gave me ice cream, she exclaimed enthusiastically. I smiled at Kayla and she beamed, knowing she had the right answer. Something like that, baby. Something like that. Subscribe to our channel so that your second chaff doesn't cheat on you and go ahead and listen to the next story because this story is nothing compared to the next one.